Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session two of the Sea Power Conference. This afternoon, we're privileged to welcome the Chief of the Indian Navy, Admiral Robin Dowan, as the keynote speaker. Regrettably, owing to illness, Dr. Jim Boutillier is unable to attend the RAN Sea Power Conference in person, but his presentation will be delivered by the Canadian Defence Attaché, Colonel Acton Kilby. Your session moderator is Commodore Mike Rothwell, Commodore Training. Ladies and gentlemen, you're invited to welcome our guest speakers as they come through you. Admiral Tim Barrett, the Chief of Royal Australian Navy, Commodore Rothwell, Colonel Kilby, Chiefs of Navies from across the world, senior officers, flag officers, members of delegation, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a distinct honor and a proud privilege for me to be present here today for the CPAR conference at Sydney and to address this august audience which represents the collective wisdom of the world navies under one roof. And I will be speaking and presenting an Indian perspective on the maritime strategic thoughts on Indo-Pacific Asia. The Indo-Pacific Asia region is predominantly maritime, with the countries of the region having a natural outflow towards the seas as they sit astride busy sea lanes of communication which transit through the oceans. And over the years, the region has emerged as the world's center of gravity in the maritime domain in the 21st century. The subject of the seas, therefore, enthuses all of us who have donned the white uniform. But I'm sure that it would be of equal interest to all others as well because we are all tied and connected to the oceans. And I would like you to reflect on a very interesting biological fact that we all have in our veins the same percentage of salt in the blood, which is the exact same percentage as salt in the oceans. And this is true, not only about the salt in our blood, but also the salt in our sweat and in our tears. We are all therefore tied and connected to the oceans. And whenever we go back to sea, whether it is to sail on it or merely watch it, we get the feeling of going back where we came from. This truly defines the relationship of humankind with the oceans and perhaps the reason why talking about the seas brings out such passion in us. The Indo-Pacific Asia region has been the vortex of intense maritime activity over centuries and has been used for spread of religion, trade, and linking of cultural links, and has emerged as a strong unifying factor in history. Today, the nations of the Indian Ocean region and the Asia-Pacific Rim are home to nearly 60% of the world's population. The Indian Ocean, which is the third largest water body in the world, spans an area of nearly 68.5 million square kilometers and is rich in oil and mineral resources. 66% of the world's oil, 50% of the world's container traffic, 33% of the world's cargo traffic transits through the water of the oceans. And this figure is bound to increase in the years to come. This region has also seen the confluence between perspectives of two great strategists. Mackinder's heartland theory still stands tall, with the core being in Asia, albeit on land. Mahan, on the other hand, looked at Asia from the maritime perspective and predicted that the Indian Ocean would be the key to the seven seas, and in the 21st century, the future of the world would be decided on its waters. Today, 
we see Indo-Pacific Asia with Mackinder's heartland as today's Indo-Pacific Asia. With West Asia as the region which is the energy supply land from which oil is literally pumped out into the arteries which flow across the oceans, across the sea lines of communication to the energy demand land which is today's South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. The Asian energy is indeed the driving force to meet the global needs, and the energy demand, as we all know, has doubled from 2000 to 2012. This region also consumes over 70% of the world's coal. The region is an economic powerhouse and is the fastest growing region in the world with an average growth rate of over 4%. It is the biggest trading region with 36% of the global exports and imports and three of the top four world economies exist and are located in the Indo-Pacific Asia region. The region is characterized by simultaneous competition as well as cooperation. We have differing international views, we have divergent national view interests, but we also have significant trade partners. The Indian Ocean region, which as I said, is the world's largest oil producing region with over one million tons of oil flowing through the oceans every year. Another unique factor which distinguishes the Indian Ocean from the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans is that 80% of the oil and trade which emanates in the Indian Ocean region is extra regional in nature. This implies that if there is any disruption of the oil flow or the trade flow, it would have a detrimental impact not just on the economies of the region but the global economies as well. Safety security and stability of the Indo-Pacific Asia region is therefore of paramount importance as it influences the well-being and prosperity of all nations. The maritime challenges in the region are as wide and varied as they come. Who could have imagined then that in the 21st century we would once again be grappling with pirates or that the major threat in the maritime domain would be from asymmetric warfare and maritime terrorism. But terrorism as well as piracy continues to pose a persistent threat with a loss of nearly 18 billion US dollars to global economy per year on account of piracy alone, which has waxed and waned in different parts of the Indo-Pacific region. The other threats include arms trafficking, drugs trafficking, poaching, and human trafficking. And the challenges in combating non-state actors are because of the anonymity of the individuality and the intent and the limited options available to nation states. The regional instabilities and turbulence also have the potential to spill into the maritime domain and the situation can best be described as fragile. As a result of the global warming and the climate change have started impacting on human and maritime security. This has impact on the oceanic living resources due to changes in the salinity and the acidity levels, possible flooding of low-lying coastal areas leading to loss of national territory. The region also is prone to natural disasters and virtually lies in the eye of the storm of the affected areas and the affected zone because nearly 70% of the extreme natural events become humanitarian disasters with an increasing demand on regional capabilities for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and maritime search and rescue. To effectively overcome the wide array of maritime challenges, we need to shape a favorable and a positive maritime environment. And the Indian Navy has planned to do this as part of the various 
pillars of our maritime strategy, which start off from aspects related such as presence and rapid response, maritime engagement, capability building and capacity enhancement, development of a regional maritime domain awareness, and maritime security operations. India has adopted a maritime security strategy with a multi-pronged and a multi-layered approach, which is based on principles of cooperation, inclusiveness, and mutual respect. The Indian Navy has shown its operational footprint across the oceans of the world, as far east as the Western Pacific, where we excise with the Russian Navy as excise Indra in Vladivostok, as far west in the Northern Atlantic, where we carried out excises with the Royal Navy, with countries of east coast of Africa, the islands of Southwest Indian Ocean, the countries of Southeast Asia, as well as Southeast Indian Ocean and Australia. We have provided rapid response in the aftermath of natural disasters, such as the tsunami of 2004, and provided assistance to Myanmar and Bangladesh after the super cyclones. The rapid response to the humanitarian disasters and the relief provided has indicated the unique brotherhood of the seas and the ability of the navies and the coast guard to catalyze and facilitate cooperation. We also provided a rapid response when there was a portable water crisis in Maldives in December last year and the Indian Navy and the Air Force provided timely and effective relief. When they, we had a turmoil in Yemen, we evacuated 3,074 personnel by Indian naval ships, including 1,783 Indians and 1,291 foreign nationals from 35 countries, provided them food, shelter, as well as medical facilities on board our ships. As part of our maritime engagement, we have carried out operational interactions with various navies of the world, including Excise Malabar with the United States Navy, carried out last year off Sasebo, and the next series would be carried out in the Bay of Bengal off east coast of India during this month. We just concluded the Konkan series of excises with the Royal Navy off the coast of the United Kingdom, the Varuna excise with the French Navy, and we just completed the first bilateral excises with the Australian Navy off the east coast of India in the Bay of Bengal with our ship's submarines and aircraft participating just a few days ago. We have carried out constructive and collaborative engagements with various navies of the world, including 20 maritime forces, and we carry out regular staff talks as well as training cooperation with them. In 2008, the Indian Navy launched the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, which was intended to promote cooperation for furthering regional maritime security strategies. Today, it has become an effective maritime construct with 22 members who have signed the Charter of Business and four observers. We also have the aspect of Milan, which is a meeting of regional navies conducted once in every two years in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands to enhance regional cooperation and has emerged as a cooperative maritime engagement construct. The last series was carried out in 2014, during which 70 navies of the region participated. The Indian Ocean Rim Association has emerged as a construct for strategic interaction for maritime security in the region. The Indian Navy will conduct the International Fleet Review at Vishakhapatnam in February 2016 with the theme of United Through the Oceans. Various navies from across the world will come together at Vishakhapatnam to strengthen bridges of friendship and partner together for a secure maritime future. We also provide assistance to the Indian Ocean region nations for capacity building and capability enhancement in accordance with the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister which is security and growth for all in the region. We carry out hydrographic surveys 
of the countries of East Coast of Africa, of Seychelles, Mauritius, Maldives, and Myanmar. We carry out EZ surveillance and patrols of Maldives, Seychelles, and Mauritius, and coordinated patrols with Myanmar, Thailand, and Indonesia. Actually, as we speak, the coordinated patrol is underway with the Indonesian Navy, which will also be graduating on to an excise. The aim of enhancing cooperation with our littoral neighbors is to promote peace and stability in the Indian Ocean region, and the Indian Navy has outlined a 10-year maritime cooperation roadmap with the navies and the countries of the region. As far as our security operations are concerned, ships of the Indian Navy have been deployed in the Gulf of Aden since 2008. Currently, our 52nd ship is on patrol, and we have safely escorted over 3,100 merchant ships from different nationalities on which nearly 23,000 Indian seafarers are embarked because nearly 7% 7 of the world's seafarers are Indians. With the efforts of the Indian Navy and the other navies operating for anti-piracy patrol, we have successfully managed to push the furthest line of piracy which had moved well east into the Indian Ocean at its peak of 2010, and today it has been contained off the Somali coast. The challenges for coastal and offshore security around the shores of India, where we have a huge coastline of 7,516 kilometers, 1,200 islands, and an exclusive economic zone of over 2 million square kilometers is a very difficult task particularly since we have a very dense merchant and a fishing traffic. At any given point in time, there are about four to 5,000 large merchant ships, about 1,000 coastal ships, and we have 240,000 fishing boats. And depending on how the fishermen are feeling on any particular day, we could have 50 to 60,000 or more out at sea. The other problem is that nearly 85 to 90% of our fishing is traditional. It is in coastal waters. And that makes the environment of the coast very dense indeed. Actually, we do not exploit our EZ effectively, and fish in Indian deep waters die of old age. But at this point in time, it's a huge problem. And therefore, we have leveraged technology to set up 87 automatic identification system stations, 46 coastal radar stations along our coast and in the island territories. And we are in the process of carrying out the registration and biometrics of nearly 4 million fishermen and about 14 million fishing community. And every single fishing boat of this 250,000 will have a transponder. The aim being to network all of them and use them as the eyes and ears as part of the surveillance program and the surveillance chain. The Indian Navy has also set up the National Command Control Communication and Information Network, where we have linked up 51 nodes of the Navy and the Coast Guard with the aim to provide a comprehensive maritime domain in the waters, awareness in the waters around India. The Indian Navy has maintained a high level of operational tempo centered around the Carrier Task Force for Sea Control, and Submarines for Sea Denial, and has emerged as a multi-dimensional network force, which is ready to operate across the spectrum of operations and combat ready to take on any challenge in the maritime domain in the 21st century. The blueprint of the future Indian Navy is firmly anchored on self-reliance and indigenization. Currently, we have 47 ships and submarines under construction, all of them in Indian shipyards, both public and private. And these range from aircraft carriers to destroyers and submarines. The Indian Navy seeks to be a stabilizing force in the Indian Ocean region to promote the security of the global commons. Moving on to looking beyond the beach. Well, here I would like to say that increased globalization has led 
to growing vulnerability of the oceans. The seas are no longer a benign medium and are getting very challenging to operate on. And therefore, stability in the maritime domain is the shared responsibility of coastal states. Because the medium of the seas is very different from the environment which is faced by the army on the land and by the air forces in the air. And I would like to illustrate this with an example. If on a particular day, the army would find soldiers from another army peering down the pickets, it would be cause for grave alarm because the land border has been violated. If the Air Force fighter aircraft had a fighter aircraft from another Air Force close to its wingtip, it would be cause for very, very grave alarm because the airspace has been violated. But as we all know, out at sea, if the officer of the watch reports to the captain that there's a warship from another country or another navy on the starboard bow, he tells him, son, flash to him good morning because she's in international waters and so are you. And therefore, the seas lend themselves for cooperation with other navies. And we need to synergize and have inclusive and cooperative efforts because no single navy, however robust, is strong enough to monitor the global commons on its own. IONS has provided us a template and an effective solution to manage the maritime affairs under the chairmanship of Australia and under the helm of Admiral Tim Barrett, we have set up working groups on information and interoperability, HADR, and counter piracy. And these working groups have done an outstanding job on looking at the core challenges and looking at further avenues and areas for cooperation. Another very important aspect, which I feel is a prerequisite which is the sharing of information to have an effective regional maritime domain awareness. Many countries of the region have set up coastal surveillance and radar chains in various countries, and these could be utilized to exchange white shipping information and enable a broader, comprehensive maritime domain awareness across the region. India has signed memorandum of understandings with various countries in the region the latest one being just two days ago with Australia. And it is our endeavor that we exchange white shipping information so as to provide a comprehensive maritime domain awareness to ensure maritime security in the global commons. There are a million professional seafarers out at sea any point in time. And each one of this professional mariner has a bubble of information and awareness around him. And if we could integrate each one of these bubbles of information, we would have a comprehensive maritime domain awareness. And maybe it will lead to a networked global commons in the future. The maritime medium is also considered ideal to provide accessibility for disaster relief. India has accorded a national priority to HADR and I would suggest that we strengthen the cooperative efforts between various maritime countries of the region to provide a rapid and collective response for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. The anti-piracy patrols in the Gulf of Aden are running with tremendous success and no piracy incidents were reported in the Arabian Sea during the last year and only two attempts in the Gulf of Aden which were unsuccessful. It is therefore evident that we need to continue with the sustained efforts of the navies of the world to completely defeat this menace out at sea. Under Australia's chairmanship, IONS and IORA have emerged as vibrant regional construct for future maritime cooperation, and I'm sure that the efforts will continue in this regard as the chair moves on. The issues and challenges that are faced in the maritime domain by the Indian Ocean region as well as the Western Pacific are common in nature. And therefore, there is some food for thought that we need to have greater interaction and dialogue, which could be the Indo-Pacific dialogue. 
And here we could also look at greater synergy between the ions as well as the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. In conclusion, the Indo-Pacific Asia region is demonstrably maritime with the interests of nation states linked to unfettered flow of maritime trade and oil because it is in the maritime domain that the interests of the world converge. And global maritime partnerships and networking among the navies is emerging as a new order of the 21st century. The seas around us are gaining newfound importance as each day goes by because of their linkages with the blue economy. And I have no doubt that the current century is the century of the seas. The maritime countries of this region have vast maritime interests. And the responsibility of protecting these maritime interests falls squarely on the shoulders of men in white uniform because it is the responsibility of the navies and the coast guards to ensure that our maritime interests, which have a vital relationship with the economic growth of the region, are allowed to develop unhindered both in peace and war. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Doan, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of Dr. Jim Butilia, presenting The Great Game Goes to Sea, the contest for maritime mastery in Asia, please join with me in welcoming the Canadian Defence Attaché, Colonel Acton Kilby. Admiral Barrett, Admirals, Generals, Marshals, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Admiral Dawn for setting the stage wonderfully here and explain a bit about Dr. Batillier's pepper, which he was asked to speak to set a bit of a scene setter for what will be discussed over the next couple of days here through a series of sessions. That I must offer at the start that um, Canada is in the process of election right now, so if you have any questions about Canadian policy, that um, I am not able to answer those in any, in any form. That, and the papers, um, the, the, the views expressed in the paper are Dr. Jim Boutillier's. Those of you who know him would r far rather have him here right now because of his animated nature and style. Um, but they are his and aimed at creating a discussion or a broader topic for all of you to, to follow. I send his regrets that due to health issues, Jim couldn't be here. He would far rather be here at this time. And I've promised him that I would openly admit as an army officer that Mahan probably had a point, and that uh, as an art, I might be a little bit wrong. The uh, that goes back to a few years ago at school. So the uh, I'll start off. The uh, it's become commonplace now to refer to the way in which the world's center of political, economic, and military gravity has shifted from the Euro-Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific. This was and is a phenomenon of truly historic proportions one characterized by its profound magnitude and uncommon speed. The Great Graham Game, referred to Dr. Petulier, was a contest of geostrategic advantage that played out in Central Asia in the 19th century. It was waged between an established empire, Great Britain, and an aspiring imperial power, Russia. Jim offers that a similar competition is unfolding today between a global power the United States, and an emerging regional power, China. While the 19th century ga great game occurred ashore, what is different now is this game is taking place at sea. This time it involves not only unprecedented rise of Chinese naval power and regional arms race centered on missiles, submarines, and maritime air power, but is aggravated by an array of potentially destabilizing maritime disputes. While the, principal, excuse me, while the principal powers have attempted to engage one another, they have fundamentally different worldviews, and the relationship is characterized by a deep-seated deep mistrust derived from cultural, economic, and historic factors. What is of significant note is an informal architecture of containment has emerged, and that is a united leading naval powers in the region 
and their anxiety and opposition to some Chinese maritime ambitions. The upshot of these developments is an increasingly, increasingly brittle and problematic oceanic environment that has raised the potential for hostilities through miscalculation or even potentially outright war at sea. Jim offers that collaborative efforts are necessarily the order of the day, but asks, will the line hold as we observe the emergence of new maritime power structure in Asia? It's observed that the traditional hub and spoke systems of alliances has begun to morph into a more complex spider web of relationships in which traditional and newer naval powers have begun to interact across these spokes. This in itself creates a web of interactions that although useful, can create challenges simply through their complexity. To add friction, the Sino-American relationship is characterized by a palpable, palpable levels of strategic wariness, while concurrently the two protagonists display an intriguing array of strengths and weaknesses. They're frequently misinterpreted through the lens of global competition and compounding this greater friction. Critical to this development in the Indo-Pacific region has been China's Demesine conversion, namely its realization of the importance of sea power as a national instrument. And as the ma maritime environment becomes increasingly problematic, the likelihood of serious mill calculations at sea continues to grow on a daily basis. But all efforts, it seems, to bring peace and good order to the region have been largely fruitless to date. As mentioned, the environment at sea is particularly challenging as a consequence of missile proliferation, cyber threats, and submarines. And these geostrategic and technological challenges give rise to a number of interrelated questions. What type of hostilities should regional navies anticipate in the future? What do these forecasts mean in the terms of acquisition of naval assets? What are the organizational and coordination mechanisms which may increase interoperability and cooperation? What does this mean, this situation, to the formulation of maritime doctrines and broader policy? And how do we all engage with China? It's suggested that the new great game is unfolding in Asia, and on this occasion, sea power is the currency of the realm. Where in the 19th century the game played out ashore, a new competition and power for power and influence is being played out at sea. It's a classic confrontation between great powers, but unlike the earlier contest, the game entails a multitude of players, all of whom have reoriented to counterbalance threats in the region. The Chinese in their defense see their actions as justified in the face of a rebalancing to the Pacific, feeling increasingly trapped by the dictates of geography and the actions of neighbors. The United States has good fortune of having an array of regional friends and allies, and the USA works continuously to offer reassurances that they're in the new great game for the long haul. Meanwhile, in response, an informal coalition of naval, naval powers is emerging in the region, aimed at countering perceived and actual threats. We are returning to the age of active naval diplomacy to telegraph ongoing commitment to friends and allies in the region. Naval exercises are increasing as a way to forge links, to encourage interoperability, and develop a critical awareness of sea power throughout the region, and perhaps open better channels of dialogue. This conference addresses the future of sea power in what is probably the globe's ultimate maritime arena. The paper was, was prepared to set considerations for what has to come. It sets questions to ponder about what should be anticipated, what should be acquired, how we should cooperate, and what does this mean to the formulation of the future for maritime power in the region? What will be the face of this multi-dimensional world where the cost of naval assets are rocketing upwards, where the political will is seldom resolute, and where naval technologies are all all evolving at a breathtaking pace. Dr. Petuli asks us to analyze some of these dynamics as they not only reflect 
but contribute to the increasing perilous state of affairs in Indo-Pacific waters. Divining the future is an enormous challenge. We have four great navies and an array of middle and smaller navies, all modernizing, all expanding, and interacting in the shadow of a trans-Pacific relationship fraught with mistrust, where the two principal powers have only the sea as their primary point of contact. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Admiral Dewan, uh, and to uh, Colonel Kilby for presenting uh, Dr. Boutelier's presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. If I just uh, remind you that uh, Colonel Kilby is uh, not able to comment on everything, nor is he the author or subject matter expert on his particular paper. If I could ask the same rules as for session one, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Can you please just restrain it to a simple question? Uh, and please wait for one of the staff members from CPOWER to deliver the microphone to you. So, first question, please. Mm. Commodore Levy. Uh, Admiral, a question for you, if I may. Uh, Commodore Pete Levy from Fleet Headquarters uh, here in Sydney. Uh, you mentioned uh, the increasing uh, uh, move of your Navy into the Western Pacific and you mentioned specifically the, uh, the interactions and exercises you do with the Russians and I know the uh, Indian Navy has been involved in RIMPAC for the last couple of iterations as well. I wonder if you could expand on any plans you may have to um, uh, increase the formal ties and your exercising with the ASEAN nations uh, in that part of the world as well. Well, as I mentioned, uh, the Indian Navy uh, has a presence in the areas around uh, the country. Uh, particularly, we had uh, for the Southeast Asian countries, we had the ships of our Eastern Fleet, uh, which proceeded this year to Indonesia, Malaysia, carried out exercises, Simbex, which we do with the uh, Singapore Navy. Uh, we, uh, currently, we have a ship uh, in Vietnam at this point in time, and the ships are on their way to uh, visit South Korea, as well as participate in the Japanese International Fleet Review this month. Uh, this is a uh, regular event for the Eastern Fleet where uh, they interact with the navies of the region. Uh, particularly, we do that in the Bay of Bengal because this is the largest bay in the world. And uh, we have uh, five countries uh, which have contiguous coastlines. Uh, India, uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, and with uh, Sri Lanka and Indonesia just outside uh, or on the edges of the Bay of Bengal, and we have regular exercises with them. And the intention is to engage with them for interactions uh, between the navies. We have certain training interactions with them. We carry out regular exercises. Where there are no scheduled exercises, we carry out uh, either coordinated patrols, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia, and Thailand. And uh, uh, as I said, with Indonesia, we are upgrading the coordinated patrol to a bilateral exercise. So this is the, with the intention so that we can strengthen the bridges of friendship between the countries, as well as uh, the levels of interoperability and mutual cooperation. Yes, please, over here on my left. Uh, David Brewster, Australian National University. Uh, a question for Admiral Dowan. Um, you mentioned the potential for greater interactions between IOMS and WPNS. What, what is your thinking in this area? How do you see it happening? Well, um, uh, as I mentioned, if we, have, if we see the challenges, the issues uh, in the maritime domain, are quite similar, whether it's in the Indian Ocean region or in the Western Pacific region. What I had in mind was that while they retain their individual identity as two organizations which look after specific regions, uh, we have, as I mentioned, established working groups which look into general areas, whether it's humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, whether it is uh, anti-piracy, or as we mentioned, uh, interoperability, information exchange, and so on. 
these are common issues both for the Pacific uh, region, the Western Pacific, as well as the Indian Ocean region. So if there was greater synergy by the medium of these working groups, uh, we could have greater interaction because there are a large number of uh, members who are common. Indeed, there are a large number of members who are observer uh, members. And then we could all benefit from whatever the advantages that accrue by interaction in these specific areas. Yes, please. Thank you. Jane Chan from the Astra Jerome School of International Studies from Singapore. Hello, Amro. A question to you as well, and a very similar question to Dr. Brewster's, uh, because you suggested um, perhaps an Indo-Pacific maritime dialogue. Um, of course, the earlier panel, we hear that you know um, more dialogues would always be better than um, having friends, partners, and even adversary not talking at all. But often we hear that you know there may just be too much or too many of such um, platforms and, and, and forums that you know some would have been rendered talk shop only. So in your mind, to allow for such forum to succeed, what would be the most important to be able to bring together perhaps IONS and WPNS? Would membership matter? Would you know the a, the ability to identify key issues really matter in that sense? Thank you. Firstly, I must go back to the point I made regarding the medium of the seas. I think the mediums of the seas unite, the oceans unite. Geography may separate us, land borders may separate us, but the oceans definitely unite. The environment out at sea is distinctly different. These are the global commons. You cannot start fencing a boundary out at sea. There are no it, uh, boundaries out in the high seas. So this medium lends itself for cooperation. The point I'm trying to make is that when you talk of an Indo-Pacific dialogue or you talk about a, a WPNS and IONS dialogue, the issues, the challenges are common. Actually, what I'm proposing is that not having greater organizations, but not really merging of organizations, but greater synergy between these various organizations. Because if we look at the challenges, let us look at this a region, as we said, is prone to natural disasters. Actually, there are some figures that 70% of the world's natural disasters occur in the Indian Ocean region. And the reason for that is that because of the levels of population, because the coastals, there are a lot of people staying on the coast and they become natural disasters. I think HADR is an ideal example where the various navies or the aspects of the countries need to cooperate, whether it's in the Western Pacific, whether it's in the Indian Ocean region. When you talk of as aspects related to anti-piracy, when you talk of aspects related to information exchange, when you want to have an effective maritime domain awareness, the prerequisite is that you need to exchange white shipping information. India is planning to have MOUs with 27 countries of the world for which we've got our government clearance and approval to exchange white shipping information so that we can have a comprehensive maritime domain awareness. Now, we would not like to restrict this to any particular region, that it should only be among the countries of this region. If the global commons are such that they transcend across oceans, I think then there is an opportunity that the countries and the navies need to talk to each other on these common issues. The other point I would like to make is that navies of the world Coast Guards, navies, I'll put all of them in one category, speak the same language. And if there is an organization where the navies are talking to each other, the progress there is invariably much quicker than when we have many agencies maybe related to a particular forum. So this is another advantage of the maritime medium that the navies can talk to each other and perhaps look at the general challenges, general issues uh, which are concerning all the people either in the Indo-Pacific region or the IOR region itself or the Western Pacific and let's look at these issues together.
So in the absence of a question immediately arising, while someone thinks of one, I'll, I'll perhaps put one too. So I was taken by your statement that you thought the, uh, it's salt that binds us biologically. I'm wondering if you could uh, enlighten us on what single ingredient might bind us internationally. Well, I think the anchor would bind us internationally, the anchor chain would bind us internationally, and the seas would bind us internationally. Because, um, the, uh, as I said, the, the medium of the seas uh, is, is something uh, that transcends across borders, across the oceans. Uh, the trade and flow of oil uh, is something that's very important to keep the global common safe and secure. So I think if the navies of the world unite uh, to take on this cause of keeping the global commons safe and secure, that is something that will unite various countries of the world. Thank you, sir. Captain Jones. And Justin Jones from the Royal Australian Navy uh, with a question for the Admiral. Sir, you mentioned uh, India's Look West policy or referred to it, and there's been some writing of late about uh, the Look West policy in terms of the Arabian Gulf in particular. Um, to what extent does that compete with or indeed complement the Look East policy that we've known about for some time? Well, um, uh, in India we are certainly looking at uh, East and acting East, uh, but that also does not mean that we look only East. I think we are looking at uh, the maritime domain the primary area of interest as far as the Indian Navy and India is concerned is the Indian Ocean region. And, uh, and since India is located where uh, you jut out the peninsula, India juts deep into the Indian Ocean and sits astride busy sea lines of communication which transit both from the west and east, I think we have to keep looking both west and east. And we have looked um, at uh, west um, as we said, our ships at this point in time are deployed in the Indian Ocean region countries. Uh, we have ships regularly visiting uh, east coast of Africa. We have the Ipsamar series of excises, which we do between the Indian, Brazilian and South African navies. Uh, we have the Konkan excise with the Royal Navy, the uh, excise Varuna with the French. Our ships have just completed their visit to the Gulf, where they visited uh, Oman, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. So I think at this point in time, um, India is clearly looking at all its neighbors in the region, both east and west. Commodore Garad. Um, thanks, Admiral Sir. Commodore Lee Garad of uh, Upton Fleet Headquarters as well. So would you like to comment on the proliferation of submarines in the Indo-Pacific? You know, uh, I mean, where information sharing and diplomacy isn't to be as forthcoming? Well, um, I think every navy um, has a right to be a multi-dimensional navy and this is the unique aspect of navies that you can operate under the sea, on the surface and in the air. And of course as part of amphibious operations it is also f from the sea onto land. So this is the unique aspect related to the navy and I think um, if ev any navy or any country decides that it needs to have a third dimension in terms of submarines, I think so be it. What does it mean? Uh, in terms of uh, the waters and the area, I think we will have to have arrangements where we have good interaction between the navies of the region. Uh, we should, and keeping the safety of submarines in mind, uh, they should be a system by which we can exchange information when we talked about information exchange so as to have a maritime domain awareness not just about the uh, white shipping information but during peacetime we should have the uh, arrangement to know where each other's ships are operating. Uh, AIS provides us that facility to some extent. This can be extended to warships and maybe to submarines as well. I don't particularly see uh, that there should be any restriction on any a country whether to operate uh, submarines or not. But yes, there should be some interaction uh, where we can operate uh, safely in the waters around and there should be some system that we can deconflict uh, the operation of our ships and submarines to make sure that the safety is not a concern.
Thank you very much. Another question there. Over to you, Desmond. Sorry if you could hold there, Desmond. I do have a question at last minute, so we'll take that question. Over here, please, on my right. Thank you. Uh, Dana Papuk, Department of Defense. Um, Admiral, I was just interested in your view of uh, China's uh, ongoing maritime presence and increase. Thank you. Well, China is a maritime nation with vast maritime interests. Uh, we have seen the growth of the Chinese PLA Navy. Uh, in every dimension, in terms of a ship, submarine, and aircraft. A large amount of China's trade in terms of oil and trade transits through the Indian Ocean region. And uh, to protect its maritime interests, China deploys its ships as part of the anti-piracy escort force in the Indian Ocean region and has been doing so since 2008. Uh, currently, we have the 21st anti-piracy escort force in place. And I think all this is part of the plan to safeguard its maritime interests. Since a huge amount of trade of China and oil transits through the ocean, uh, this is um, the way of safeguarding the interests. And um, I think this is in uh, accordance with what their national priorities and the tasks and roles of their navies are. So we do have time for another question, should anyone wish to raise one. Commander Ralston. Uh, my question is to the Admiral, sir. Commander Ralston from Training Force Headquarters, Royal Australian Navy. Uh, I was very interested in your uh, concept of using the fishing boats as a, a surveillance tool and fitting each shipping boat with a um, transponder. I was just wondering what your expectations of that as a surveillance medium are. Well, I must say that it's uh, not an easy task. It's been quite an Herculean task. But uh, as you're probably aware, the Indian Navy was um, designated as the lead agency uh, to coordinate various aspects of uh, coastal as well as offshore security uh, around the waters of India. We have about 16 different agencies which operate in the maritime domain. And the task is uh, huge because, as I said, we have 4 million active fishermen, 14 million of the fishing community, and 250,000 fishing boats. So we went about uh, in a systematic manner. We've set up the AIS chains. As I said, we have 87 of these stations all along our coast. In the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which are in the Bay of Bengal, off the Lakshadweep Islands, which are off the west coast of India, and the radar stations. Having done the aspect of leveraging technology, how do we ensure that all the 250,000 fishing boats and all the fishermen, about 4 million of them, uh, would be compliant with this. So first, we sent the Navy and the Coast Guard actually on foot and at times on motorcycles or whatever came their way to visit every single coastal village on the west and east coast of India, to speak to them in their language, because in India we have many languages, and they had to speak to them in their language to try and understand why they should comply. We made them understand that firstly it is for their own safety, because we have very rough weather during the monsoons, and we normally get telegrams from the coastal states that 150 fishermen are missing. So we told the fishermen that normally we don't know where to look for them. So in case they had these transponders, in that case, we would be able to detect them and therefore they became willing to get registered to get these transponders. So now that uh, the compliance is actually looked after in our country by the coastal states, we have nine coastal states and the island territories, the compliance as far as registration of the fishermen is concerned, it's about 60 to 80 plus percent depending on different states. And the fishing boats are being registered. There was a huge issue as to who should pay for the transponders. That debate is now over. The government will pay for these transponders over a period of time and be, get subsidized. So the aspect related to how it will work in a fishing community would look like this, that a fisherman will, in a sleepy village will go with his biometric card to what looks like an ATM machine, 
punch in and it will indicate who is this fisherman, who is the crew. As the boat travels out, depending on if it's a coastal vessel, it will have a different kind of transponder which will work on VHF. If it's a deep uh, sea fishing vessel, which we hope many more will fish in the deep sea so that fish don't die of old age. So as they proceed out, they will get linked in through the satellite. All this then gets connected through, as I mentioned, the NC3I network, the National Command Control Communication and Information Network, which is up and running at this point in time. And when we pick up, and this will then get reflected into the state maritime centers and the picture will get complied. How will it work? Well, what we are looking at is that it will take time, but once there is compliancy, and even if we get a picture which will be very cluttered in the waters around India, we will get to know as to who are the boats or which are the boats which are non-compliant. And that gives us some finite number of boats on which to concentrate on by the Navy and the Coast Guard. What we also did as part of the education, when we spoke to these fishermen, we conveyed to them that you are the eyes and ears and there is a threat out at sea. So we've all given them some toll-free mobile numbers and told them that when you're out at sea, when you look at 50 fishing boats and you find that one of them is not one of your own clan, all you have to do is to press a button and that call will get into the state maritime centers. And we've had some very good response on some innocent boats from another state which were passing by. I think it is uh, work in progress um, and it's a difficult task, uh, but the intention is that we network this entire four million community and which truly become the eyes and ears because only then it is possible to have a comprehensive maritime domain awareness because technology alone cannot help us. All it will result is in more cluttered displays. So what we hope to have is that we'll have a display where we know that X numbers are compliant. Then there may be 100 boats on a screen or 10 boats on a screen which are not compliant and then the Coast Guard or the Navy can go out and check them out. Yes, please, sir. Question in the centre. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Commodore Esha from Bangladesh Navy. Currently, I'm looking after the Armed Secretary, sir, in Bangladesh. Sir, um, thank you very much for attaching a lot of importance to IONS. And uh, now, sir, uh, as you understand, the charter of business in IONS is basically promotes more multilateralism and the inclusiveness. Now, uh, if you see on the other hand, there are a lot of bilateral exercises going on. For example, exercise, exercise like uh, Malabar. So do you think this kind of bilateralism or bilateral exercise is, uh, is some way contradicts with the, the promotion of the Charter of Business or the spirit of finance? Thank you very much. It's not an aspect related to a spirit of one or the other. You absolutely rightly said the aspect is the spirit of ions is spirit of cooperation. It is the aspect related to managing these exercises. Uh, the way it has been kept at this point in time is that whenever our ships visit various countries, including yours, um, we carry out passage exercises. Uh, because you must understand that in the pie chart of what the Navy is required to do in terms of operational activities, in terms of operational training, in terms of looking at other avenues, out of areas, so on, so on and so forth, we actually have to be prepared with various professional aspects whether it's gunnery shoots, whether it's anti-submarine firing, and so on. And foreign cooperation forms a small slice of that. And therefore, we have to be careful that we are not overreaching ourselves. Can you imagine if all the 22 uh, countries which have signed the Charter of Business decided to excise together? It will be a huge excise, and all we'll be doing is preparing and preparing for that. So the aim is to keep it simple. So right now, we have got passage excises. It doesn't restrict anybody that we will not have uh, multilateral excises, uh, but it will depend on the time and place. Uh, as I mentioned to you, we have the International Fleet Review taking place in Vishakhapatnam, where uh, currently we hope to have 46 navies of the world represented. We are also planning to have uh, passage excises as part of Sail Together, 
uh, when uh, at the end of the fleet review as the different navies set out. So there would be opportunity for them to do some multilateral exercises. When the regional navies meet up for Milan, it's a large number of navies. Last time we had 17 of them. So I think, uh, and, and navies cannot be rigid. We are flexible. So I think we have to adopt a more flexible approach. Clearly the intention is not to just do bilateral or just do multilateral. I think it depends on the opportunity that uh, arises. And uh, certainly the underlying theme is to be united through the oceans. The underlying theme is to strengthen the bridges of friendship and work together for keeping the global commons safe and secure. Come on, let's. Thanks, Michael. I'm, I'm not in that role at all at the moment. Um, David Letts from the ANU College of Law. Um, Admiral, the system that you just um, described for the fishing vessels, um, the transponders, the um, reporting aspect of that potentially raises some interesting issues in terms of exemptions um, from attack and targeting that fishing vessels would ordinarily have under the laws of armed conflict. And so have you thought then, for what you've described from a peacetime maritime security law aspect, understood, and that doesn't raise those issues, but have you thought about how you would not use those vessels in that sort of reporting role if India was, for whatever reason, involved in an armed conflict at sea? Well, actually, the situation will change depending on the peacetime situation and in a wartime situation. And uh, what we have looked at at this point in time is to set up a network where all these fishermen are actually compliant as far as getting us a comprehensive maritime domain awareness is concerned. As far as the aspect of exchange of white shipping information or at least their own positions. Because as I mentioned, the seas are no longer a benign medium. It was perfectly fine that fishermen could carry out their fishing regardless in the waters around them. Today, any innocuous fishing boat could be a maritime threat out at sea. And therefore, it is the intention to take them all into the part of the eyes and ears and the surveillance mechanism, where at least we know where these fishing boats are operating. How they will be taken into account in times of activities of war is a totally different subject. And that will be taken into account as per the rules of engagement at that point in time. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, sorry. Yes, please, here in the centre. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Commander Tawila from uh, Papua New Guinea. I, I heard that, uh, I sort of heard you that uh, your fish die of old age. Uh, there are situations where, you know, they source of fish in uh, certain small states. They die of prematurity through illegal fishing, unregulated, unregistered uh, fishing. What would be your advice that those small nations will let their fish die in mature age? Thank you. Well, it, it's a difficult situation. Uh, the reason why I mention that is that uh, we have a huge exclusive economic zone. Um, extends up to 200 uh, nautical miles and covers nearly 2 million square kilometers. But because a large amount of our fishing, nearly 85%, is uh, traditional by nature. Uh, fishermen do not venture out at sea. And therefore, efforts are now on to give them some subsidy, uh, to provide them uh, better boats so that they can go out to sea and uh, fish in those waters to provide subsidy and soft loans so that they can better trawlers, which can do deep sea fishing, so that we can optimally exploit our EZ as far as uh, fishing is concerned. And so that fishing is not just concentrated just about 20 miles off the coast. As far as the uh, uh, advice for overfishing is concerned, I think it's an aspect that every country has to regulate depending on the requirement. Uh, some countries overfish in particular regions, but I think every country would have to look at the local circumstances and the environment prevailing in their environment to decide and regulate that. Captain MacArthur. 
Admiral Captain MacArthur, thank you for your presentation. Very um, simple question. Do you consider that there should be any um, regulation or restriction of military activity in Indian um, EEZ? Sorry? Do you have um, any view with regards to any restriction of the conduct of military activity in national EEZs? I, I think uh, the, as far as military activity is concerned, it must uh, follow the laid down um, international law. And as far as the uh, rules and regulations which govern all the marinas out at sea, and um, I think the international laws laid down as to how navies or coast guards or other um, maritime agencies uh, need to operate. And my view is that uh, it needs to follow that. And we should have the aspect related to the freedom of the seas uh, as laid down by the international regulations. Thank you very much, Desmond. On this occasion, you now have the con. Ladies and gentlemen, th that concludes CPA session two, day one. Uh, once again, please join with me in thanking Admiral Dowan and Colonel Acton Kilby. <laughs> Delegates are now invited to participate in the various Pacific industry networking in functions that are taking place throughout the exposition halls. Reminder uh, that uh, session three, sea power and maritime strategy in the Indo-Pacific will commence in this conference hall at 08.30 tomorrow morning. We wish you a good evening.